Let's go. You ready? Just declare right now, God has called me, anointed me, ordained me for such a time as this. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't have to feel it because I operate by faith. The substance of things hoped for and yet not yet seen. And here's what this means. It means that we go all in before we even see our cards because of what Jesus has done. We can take a great, great risk because on the cross, Jesus did it all. Christianity is 100% supernatural. When you open up in Genesis chapter 1, you see our supernatural God hovering in the chaos, bringing about the cosmos, which means order out of the chaos. And Jesus is still in the business of bringing cosmos out of chaos. But his operation is different because he doesn't necessarily himself hover in the chaos Rather, he sends his sons and his daughters, the body of Christ, to be his body, to be his ambassadors, to hover in the tohu vavohu and bring about cosmos realities. And this is what we are looking at. We are looking at um, a series where we're diving into um, the history of our great faith. And we are looking at um, men and women that we're calling the interrupters um, that really brought heaven to earth. And this is fascinating because we're actually studying the first um, or the, the 12 apostles. We're looking at the 12 disciples that followed Jesus after he left and kind of what their journeys and what their, what their experiences were like. And um, this is the first time since New Testament survey in Bible school that I've actually studied these guys. In fact, there wasn't even a course called the 12 apostles. Um, you kind of get these different um, aspects as you study the book of Acts, et cetera, et cetera. But this is actually my first time doing a deep dive of the 12 disciples that follow Christ. And this is fascinating. In fact, we're going to be talking talking about um, uh, some peeps tonight that perhaps you've never necessarily, I mean, I was learning things, <laughs> maybe things I should have known. I mean, things that were kind of tripping me out a little bit. Um, and so anyways, this is going to be a fun journey. Now, after we do, after you do the, 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 you'll get used to me. I don't necessarily speak English all the time. So after the ding, 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 right? Okay, amen. So after we study the 12 <laughs> apostles, we're going to study um, 12 mystic saints. We're also going to incorporate the desert fathers as part of that, okay? Um, and then we're actually going to study a, uh, the 12, there's not the 12, we're, we're doing a sample and a gathering of 12 reformers um, that God used to bring a restoration of the supernatural um, because there was a great divorce of the supernatural from Christianity during the Great Reformation when Martin Luther split off from the Catholic Church. And because the Catholic Church was using the supernatural um, as evidence to support their doctrine, Martin Luther said, you can keep your false doctrines and your supernatural. And we saw a divorce of the supernatural with the church during the, the Great Reformation. It wasn't until really the late 1800s and the early 1900s that we began to see, um, guys, we're talking just over 100 years ago, that we began to see a restoration of the supernatural back to the church. And God used um, a, an assortment of generals. So after we do the 12 apostles and after we do uh, the desert fa fathers and a few of the, of, of the mystics, we're going to look at um, uh, these generals that God used, including but not limited to people like Catherine Coleman, people like Amy Simple McPherson, Mariah Woodworth Eder, who would trance out for days in a frozen posture without eating, without drinking, as the, you know, and people would come to observe her as she would be in a trance. We'll be looking at the great plumber, Smith Wigglesworth. Who would, you know, one of my favorite Smith Wigglesworth stories, takes a dead man and throws him up against the wall and commands life and drops him and he was still dead. Picks him back up and throws him against the wall and commands him to live and drops him and he's still dead. He proceeds to throw the dead man up against the wall until life returned back to his body and he came back to life. <laughs> Plumbers. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at um, John Alexander Dowie. Um, it, it, uh, we'll look at um, <sighs> William Branham. That's a good one. Anyways, it's going to be really good. 12. Uh, and then we're going to look at 
12 modern day living supernatural, supernaturalists. So we'll look at people like Mahesh Shavda. What, one of the original glory gangsters, as I call him, within, uh, within our generation who is still, okay, favorite Mahesh Shavda story. Um, he's ministering in Africa and a naked man falls to the roof and hits the ground. Boom. All right. This naked man was a witch, okay, who had shapeshifted into something, was flying over his meeting. When he flew over the church, he lost all of his power and fell through the roof and hit the ground, hit the floor. Isn't it? <laughs> good times, good times. So that's, <laughs> that's the journey, that's the journey um, uh, that, we're, that we're on. And we're going to begin, uh, uh, we, we started this two weeks ago by looking at um, the Apostle Peter. And, uh, and, and that was wild. Tonight we're going to look at uh, uh, Peter's brother. In fact, we're going to be looking at two brothers tonight. We're going to be looking at Peter's brother, okay? And we're also going to be looking at John's brother, the Apostle John. So uh, tonight it's all about the bros, okay? So our first study we're going to begin with is um, uh, uh, the Apostle known as Andrew, Okay, boom. <laughs> They're trying to fix my, my trigger. Brandon, you're the best. Let, hey, can we just celebrate our tech team tonight? <laughs> Come on. We've got, uh, we've got Nate on sound, Brandon on lighting, Glenn on PC. We got Michael in the background. These guys are the best. We, 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 had, some, we, we had something, we, we had something chew through one of our, our wires and, and, and these guys were doing <laughs> some, don't worry about it, it's all good. The, 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 the Zorton man or whatever they call him will be here tomorrow. It'll be good. Okay. Everyone say the Apostle Andrew. This guy, this guy is a guy that I haven't necessarily done a lot of study on. And this is kind of, this is kind of interesting. This is uh, Peter's brother. And what's interesting is that each of the Gospels uh, refer to him as Peter's brother. Have you ever been referred to as um, this is so-and-so's brother, or this is so-and-so's husband, or this is so-and-so's wife. You're like, I've got a name, okay? No, this guy didn't have a name. It was like, hey, everybody, this is uh, Peter, okay? This is James, this is John, and this is Peter's brother, okay? <laughs> He's like, I got a name. It's Andrew. Okay, Andrew, that's fine. You're Peter's brother. <laughs> He's listed in various lists of the disciples. We know that he is one of uh, one of the twelve. Um, we know that uh, 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 um, uh, that he was um, very manly. <laughs> and the reason why I say this is that his name is actually, this is really curious, his name actually means courageous and manly. And so we see this, this guy, this Andrew, he's a fisherman, and we also know about Peter, that Peter was also very manly, okay? When I say manly, he probably wore a cowboy hat, okay? And uh, he probably looked kind of like the Marlboro Man, okay? Um, just very manly. You know what I'm saying? Didn't smoke, but um, manly. Awesome. Fisherman. Peter and Andrew. Fisherman. Peter's brother, okay? And we see that they would work on Peter's boat. And so when Jesus comes and, uh, and does the miracle um, where he multiplies the fishes, this so captured their attention um, that we see from this point on, Jesus says, hey, you guys have an amazing uh, fishing career. You just saw what I did. You guys were fishing all night. You didn't catch anything. Um, catch your nets on the other side. All of a sudden, they began catching a tremendous amount of fish. And Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men and Peter and his and his brother <laughs> lay down their job they leave everything to follow Jesus now what's interesting about this this Andrew this Andrew the um, uh, uh, the apostle this disciple of Jesus is that we see in John 1 29 that this Andrew was actually a follower of John the Baptist and so in John 1, 29, we see it says the next day, uh, John was uh, again, John the Baptist was with uh, his two disciples when they saw Jesus passing by. 
And uh, John the Baptist says, look, it's the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard this, they said to him, uh, 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 they said, well, and they, they followed Jesus. And turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said, come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying. And then they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. And Andrew, Simon's, uh, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and, uh, and uh, when he said, follow Jesus, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon to tell him, and we have, we have found the Messiah. That is, we have found the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. So the apostle, um, Andrew, is referred to as um, the first called, okay? Uh, the first one uh, who met Jesus and began telling everybody about Jesus so that when Jesus came to the boat, did this miracle, he's like, this is the one. This is the guy. This is the guy that we met. This is the Messiah. This is the one that we were waiting for. So Andrew kind of broke the ice that he's here. Messiah is here. Everything's changed. Oh my, OMG, he wants us to follow. Oh, look at all these fishies. Yes, it's time. He's here. And so um, Andrew became known as a great evangelist or maybe one of the first of evangelist um, within the church. In fact, he has quite a missionary journey. And this is where when you read about Andrew, you're not going to see a whole lot about him. You know, uh, 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 it's, it's, by the way, you know, you, um, Peter, James, John, Peter's brother, okay? And he doesn't necessarily get a book in the Bible, but as you're studying various first century texts, there's actually quite a bit that's written about him from first century uh, theologians, including this part of Andrew, where he got so impacted from following Christ that after the, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ, and after the great persecution that hits in the book of Acts, we see that they, there's a great scattering in the church. So believe it or not, God actually uses persecution. Yeah, in fact, persecution was very essential to the church in the book of Acts for this move of God to go from just being a local expression to being a global movement, okay? And so um, we see a great scattering, and this Andrew begins taking uh, the gospel um, uh, 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 all around. Um, well, first of all, boom. And we might have to go through a couple slides here, Brandon. There's, uh, there's the, the, the famous painting of Jesus uh, and the fishermen. This is John the Baptist, nude. <laughs> Boom. Okay, here we have the Black Sea. If you go down, you can see um, uh, uh, Israel, you can see Jerusalem. Jerusalem's right there at the very, very bottom. And so it is believed and it is uh, 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 um, tracked by first century theologians that the apostle um, Andrew uh, commuted from Jerusalem up to the Black Sea, up to Georgia, where he began sharing um, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing the testimonies, sharing the miracles um, that, he had, uh, that he had seen. In fact, um, he is known as the apostle of Georgia, um, and every region, both north and south of the Black Sea. Um, there is record of St. Andrew, as he's known within the Catholic Church, going and sharing the gospel all throughout Romania, okay? So it's believed that he traveled all the way around the Black Sea, sharing about Jesus Christ, the miracles that he had seen, doing many miracles um, himself, even going into the region that is known as um, the Ukraine today, uh, where, he, uh, where there's records of prophetic words um, that he gave. In fact, in this part of the world, throughout Georgia, throughout Moldova, throughout Romania, there are many uh, uh, various uh, temples, many monuments, and they're honoring um, Andrew and his missionary work all throughout um, that area. Uh, into Cyprus, okay? Um, we see uh, the, this island of Cyprus, early Christian tradition, um, uh, speaks of St. Andrew, um, who came in on a ship. And um, the ship went off course. It ran aground. And Andrew uh, 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 strikes one of the rocks 
with his staff, and upon striking the rock with his staff, a spring of healing waters begins gushing forth um, from this rock, and um, using it, the sight of the ship's captain, who had been blind in one eye, which is maybe why they ran aground, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> The ship's captain, who was blind, all right, well, that explains why you, maybe he ran aground, um, used the water, washed his eyes, and found that his vision was restored after washing his eyes um, uh, with this water. Um, so, Andrew, not a lot known about him, except for we do know that if you're going to uh, subscribe to various writings from various sources, even uh, trusted sources from the first century would say that he loved Jesus, he was impacted by Jesus, he experienced the miracles of Jesus, and then upon the persecution of the church, he took his faith and he began evangelizing everywhere he went, uh, Christianizing several different regions. He was radically uh, supernatural and God used him. Uh, interesting thing about Andrew is that he was also uh, a martyr. Um, we see a record of his crucifixion um, in around uh, A.D. 60. Um, boom. <laughs> and like his brother Peter, um, Andrew allegedly didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same way as Jesus, but tradition claims he was bound, not nailed, to a cross, which was hung in the shape of an X instead of the shape of a T. It is claimed that Andrew, while tethered to this X, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ for three days straight as he hung on the cross. And it didn't emerge until uh, uh, decades later after his death. According um, to um, various sources, um, Andrew... Um, uh, would 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 use a cross whenever he whenever he preached, and there is a recorded. Uh, and again, this isn't in the Bible, so you just have to say this is an alleged recording of his declaration as he was um, uh, uh, tethered to a cross. Okay, here's this guy hanging from an X, heralding and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is his message um, as, uh, as recorded. Hail, O cross, inaugurated by the body of Christ and adorned with his limbs as though they were precious pearls. Before the Lord mounted you, you inspired an earthly fear. Now, instead of endowed with heavenly love, you are accepted as a gift. Believers, know of the great joy that you possess and as of the multitude of gifts you have prepared. I come to you, therefore confident and joyful, so that you may too receive me, exultant as, as a disciple of the one who was hung upon you. O blessed cross, clothed in majesty and the beauty of the Lord's limbs, take me, carry me far from men and restore me to my teacher, so that through you, the one who redeemed me by you may receive me. Hail, O cross. Yes, hail indeed. The Fox's Book of Martyrs says that Andrew preached the gospel to many, um, to many nations, but on his arrival at Edessa, he was taken and crucified on a cross, the two ends which were fixed transversely in the ground, hence the, the derivation of the term St. Andrew's Cross. Boom. Manly, courageous, manly. This is an image of perhaps true masculinity. I, I, I think of Paul that would say, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, laying yourself down for her. Two weeks ago, we read of the life of Peter, who was also crucified according to church tradition and requested in the same way to be crucified in a way saying he was unworthy to be crucified in the same way that his Lord had been crucified and, was re and requested to be crucified upside down as he was unworthy to die the same death as his Lord Jesus Christ. I just got to say one more thing. Andrew bound, okay, stripped naked and before the people preaching and prophesying. 
Jeez. That's awesome. Boom. Next, we're going to talk about the apostle, the disciple known as James. Okay, James is the ga- is the uh, is the given name um, uh, for three different dudes. So this is where it gets super confusing, and, and uh, uh, we see three different James. Okay, um, okay. So there's James, the son of Zebedee. He's known as James the Greater. Okay, now. Three different James, okay? There's even two different disciples named James. You confused yet? Okay, and then there's the James that wrote the book of James, and he's not even one of the 12 disciples. What? They didn't teach me that in Sunday school. I'm like, what's going on? What, what is all these James? Now, if I could choose to be a James, I would want to be James the Greater. Because believe it or not, there was James the Greater, and then there was James the Less. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, so there's Peter's brother, Okay, I have a name. That's fine, Peter's brother. There's James the Less, okay? And he gets to be a, a, a disciple. Very little is mentioned about him. Um, uh, James, uh, the son of uh, Alphaeus. Is that how you say it, Alphaeus? Okay, so, uh, pr- close enough. Um, he's mentioned, James the Less is mentioned 10 times in the New Testament. Um, his, uh, 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 and, um, uh, uh, and then we see uh, the third James. He's known as James the Pillar. And this is James, the brother of, of Jesus. So the James that we're studying tonight is not James, the brother of Jesus, okay? That James, guess who his parents were? Joseph and Mary, okay? He was literally the brother of Jesus, and he didn't even believe in Jesus until later on. You know, okay, and that, 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 that's really interesting because, come on, imagine if your brother was like, I am God incarnated. And you're like, no, you're not, bro. You're my brother. I know who you are, right? No, you're not, right? So, He's known as James the Pillar. James, the brother of Jesus, the, the James who wrote uh, the book of Genesis. What we're going to look at tonight is, is the apostle known as James, um, who was the son of Zebedee. He was the brother of John the Beloved. Okay? Um, uh, James the greatest or the greater um, is mentioned a number of times. Um, in fact, uh, it's believed he was the older brother of John the Beloved. Um, James worked with his brother John, okay? Uh, they, were, they were fishermen. Um, they, James was also a follower of John the Baptist. We see this um, in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Um, he immediately receives the call to follow Christ when, when Jesus invites him to come and follow me. Uh, when Jesus prays all night about who to choose, he's going to choose 12 disciples. Um, and we see this in Luke chapter 15, verses 12 to 6. Uh, James is the third man mentioned after Peter um, uh, uh, and Peter's brother, Andrew. Man, talk about stressful. Jesus is up all night. He's praying, who's going to be the 12? Can you imagine that? Who's gonna, and you're just waiting and hoping that he says your name. Like, who's going to be the 12? Peter. Oh. Right? Andrew. Oh, darn. John. Oh. Darren. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. And so Jesus prays all night, and he's looking for the 12, and he says, James. Okay? He's, he's the third man um, chosen. Jesus calls James and his brother John, okay? Um, uh, and we see this nickname um, uh, given to them, the Sons of Thunder. Man, if I could have a nickname, that would be it, okay? I'm telling you, John the Beloved, you know, a, a good friend of mine was just talking about how, you know, how, how kind of wimpy John was. You know, he's always kind of like, Jesus, can I lay my head on your chest? I want to hear your heart beat. It, no, no, no. Um, these brothers, um, boom, I got a picture of them. Look at it. They ain't messing around. He's got his Bible kind of uh, tucked into his jacket like it's his gat. You know, these guys, these are, these, these, are the, these are the sons, these are the sons of thunder. We, we know that they both uh, have fiery tempers, okay? These fishermen, I tell you, you, know, you, got, you, got, you got Peter, who's just passionate. You know, Peter, the guy that pulls out the sword of the Roman that, that would crucify you and cuts off the, 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 the Roman. These guys, they, they were not joking. Jesus picked some bad mama jamas to be his disciples, right? And so uh, 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 they proved this. You know, when they sought permission, you look in uh, Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 51 to 56, when the Samaritans um, reject uh, Jesus, um, they seek 
permission, um, uh, Peter and, uh, and, and, um, and, and James, to, they seek permission to call down fire. Sorry, John, I'm getting confused now. John and James, they seek permission to call down fire on the village of, their, of the Samaritans. So like, Jesus, you just got rejected. You know what you got to do. Destroy them all. <laughs> the sons of thunder. Every, you know, does every, anyone want to receive Jesus? No, no. Then you're all dead. <laughs> These guys are crazy. They also had the audacity to approach Jesus, and they brought their mom, which is funny. This is Matthew 20, verse 20. And they say, um, they ask him, and this time, it's the sons of thunder that are like, hey, Jesus, um, we would like to seek your permission that we would, that we, these two brothers, because they're awesome, that we would, that we would sit um, at your right hand and your left hand in the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's who, these, who these guys are. We see that uh, James is a part of the, the inner circle. So Jesus had an inner circle. It's Peter and James and John. Um, when we studied Peter, we looked at the miracle of the Mount of Transfiguration. That's one of the trippiest miracles of Jesus, okay? Jesus is like, hey, I want to give you a glimpse into what my prayer closet is like. Takes them up on the mountain. All of a sudden, wah, 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 wah. Begins to go translucent. All of a sudden, Elijah shows up. Hey, hey, hey. And they're just like, oh, my God. Right? Moses shows up. It's crazy. This really happens in the Bible. Okay? And, and who was there? The inner three. Peter, James, and John. We also see that the same three were taken in and uh, uh, at the raising of, 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 the, of the daughter who is dead, the daughter of uh, Jairus from the dead, Mark 5.35, it's also Peter and James and John that were invited into the Garden of, Gethsem- uh, of Gethsemane. And these three men were taken further than all of the other uh, disciples to pray with Jesus. There was the inner three, and then on occasion, Andrew was included with the inner three um, from time to time to be included in, uh, in some of the more uh, intimate events. And so you see Jesus, you know, he would say, okay, my, my close three. So you got Jesus and you've got these different spheres of the target, right? You've got Jesus, you've got his, his trusted three. And then from time to time, uh, 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 Peter would be like, hey man, can my brother tag along? And Andrew's like, yeah, what's up, guys? And they're like, yeah, he's cool. You can, you can come. So that's, that's how you got the inner three. Then from time to time, Peter's bro- brother got to come. <laughs> okay? And, um, and he was oftentimes included. Now, um, James um, uh, uh, was the first disciple that was a martyr for the gospel. Now, the first martyr was Stephen the deacon. Okay? epic, right? Um, He is stoned, and while stoned, he begins to preach the gospel. He begins to look up. He sees the glory of God as his spirit begins to engage with heaven as they are, as they are stoning. It's such a profound, it's such a, it's, it's this, this, it's this moment of just, um, on one hand, what seems to be um, the bliss of the Lord that removes him from the pain of his execution where he is engaging with heaven and gracefully transfers over from his physical body into his glorified body, okay? Um, absolutely, absolutely gorgeous and profound and, and the very first martyr within, within the church, Stephen. But James was actually the first disciple that was, that was, that was martyred. And it is believed that the Apostle James was martyred in A.D. Uh, 44. And this can be found in the book of Acts. This is in Acts chapter 12. It says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Boom. I think we got uh, a painting of, uh, this is, these are famous paintings that are, um, that are capturing these various uh, moments with the, the, 12, uh, the 12 disciples. And um, we see King Herod was eager to win the favor of the Jews since Christianity was spreading. And he believed 
persecuting Christians would earn the Jews appreciation. And when he killed James, the Jews approved of it, Acts 12, 23. And so uh, uh, Herod had Peter imprisoned, but the night before Peter was to go to trial, God sent an angel to rescue him, and he had escaped the prison uh, unnoticed. Uh, in the fourth century, uh, we see the, uh, the, the scholar Isavis, the father of church history, he quotes Clement of Alexandria about James' death. And it says here, it appeared that the guard who brought him, speaking of James, into the court was so moved that when he saw him testify, okay, that he confessed that he too was a Christian. And so the guard and James were both taken away together. And on the way, he asked James to forgive him. James thought for a moment, and then he said, I wish you peace, and then he kissed them, and both were beheaded at the same time. James' execution wasn't the first time that Christians were persecuted, and it was far from the last, but it did mark the first time that one of the 12 apostles drank from the cup that Jesus drank, prophesied by Jesus in Mark chapter 10, verse 39. Listen, I'm telling you that what God is about to do is he's about to stir up the same kind of passion for Christ Jesus on the earth. He's going to stir up a passion generation that's not just walking in hype, but they are walking in the substance of things hoped for and not yet seen. And God is going to honor that substance. And I am telling you, just like the precedent of Jesus established where he literally chose 12 stinking, ordinary, uneducated men to represent himself on the earth. He, the, the, the first cats that we're looking at are very um, uh, unrehearsed fishermen that Jesus says, hey, you got what it takes. Come and follow me. What Jesus is going to do is he's going to use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And if you want to be a part of what Jesus is doing on the earth, all you have to say is yes. We're going to see, we're going to see stories coming up of just ordinary people that got so hungry for the Lord that God came upon them. Why? Because hunger is irresistible to the Lord. And even in the same way that we are seeing martyrs today um, throughout the nations, we are on the precipice of a next level missions um, move of God. I was just chatting with uh, Scotty um, over at the YWAM base. He's the director of the YWAM base uh, there in Colorado Springs. And he was talking about what God is doing right now with a couple of guys that went in to meet with Lou Engel. They said, we got a prophetic word for you. The prophetic word is this. You are to change the name of the call to the send because we are about to see a mass revival and we are about to see a mass sending of young people to the nations and it's going to be unprecedented. Scott began telling me about the events that are coming out. He began to tell me the event that they just had in Brazil where over 40,000 young people showed up and responded and said yes to this great call of Jesus to take the gospel to the nations to unreached people groups and I'm telling you what we're about to see is a generation that doesn't just show up with lofty words but they're going to show up with a proclamation of Jesus Christ and a demonstration of the kingdom of heaven. You say, I wonder what this next move of God is going to look like. I believe it's going to look like a hungry people that say, I am allergic to religion. I want Jesus. I don't want just knowledge about Jesus. I want to walk in his power. I want to walk in his character. I want to walk in his authority. I am not content with tradition, and I refuse to finish in the natural what he began in the spirit. The reason why we talk about these guys, the reason why we kind of talk about this this passion is not to tease us about how great things used to be. It is to put a hunger in your heart that if God could use these guys that frequently lost their temper and asked crazy questions like, hey, could we be your favorite? Is that any cool? Like, you're gonna, you gotta ask some favorites. 
Can I be your favorite? And when we get to your kingdom, is it cool if I'm the guy that sits right next to you? Because let's just admit, the rest of these guys are fools, okay? You want, you want me, you want me. It, it, and Jesus loved them. Can I tell you what brings encouragement to me? Jesus loves fools. I think it was Delirious uh, who released an album. In the, any children of the 90s? Or the 80s, I, I think it was Delirious. They released an album called King of Fools. And this is what our God is looking for. Ordinary uh, men and women. Ordinary children who say, I want God and I want his spirit and I, I want what he wants above anything else. I want what he wants. I'm willing to lay it all down to follow him even if it costs me everything. And I believe that we're going to see a generation that is so fearless that they will preach the gospel even if it means losing their own lives. And I believe they are already seeing it. I believe that something has already, already begun. You know, praise the Lord for Bethel. They're going to be here next week. R Richard and, uh, and Libby are going to be here at uh, 9 and, 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 uh, and 11. And then we've got a bunch of third-year students, and they're going to be here uh, that night. But can I tell you what's so cool about Bethel? Bethel does not exist just to tease you in the same way that the book of Acts doesn't exist just to tease you. Josh, can you, can you come and do your thing? No. Bethel exists to inspire courage within you because we are going to begin to see Bethels all throughout the United States of America. Gatherings of two or more where God says, I will gather in the midst of you because you are gathering to seek me with all of your heart. And I'm not just talking about the prototype and Reading. I'm talking about altars, these altar places that are established in, in homes and schools, these altar places where people just say, I just want Jesus. Jesus, and I just want what Jesus wants. And I'm telling you, listen, if you're here tonight and you're jacked up and you're messed up and you're lonely and you're addicted and you're confused, praise the Lord. You know why? Because that makes you a great candidate to meet Jesus. I am telling you, he can show up in a moment and he can change the rest of your life. Yeah, it's true. There's a big bad devil, and he wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to confuse you. But we have a great, great shepherd who wants to bring clarity and wants to relieve, release life and life abundantly within you. You know, how many of you in this last season, you have asked yourself the question, man, did God really say did God really say that? Did God really call me? Did God really heal me? Did God, did God really save me? In this last season, even in um, 2020 and 2021, and even this whole thing with uh, COVID, I've chatted with so many, not just people, but I'm talking ministers. Ministers with incredible anointings, people that I so honor, people that I so respect that say this has been one of the hardest seasons within their life. And not because of COVID, because the enemy's throwing everything that he has against the church. The enemy is coming at the church in an unprecedented, we have never seen an attack on leaders and intercessors and mighty men and women of God. We have never seen such an attack on our sons and our daughters like we've seen just in the last two years. Man, if you feel like all of hell is coming after you in this time, you are not alone. And if you feel confused, like, man, God, did you really say that? God, did you really say that? God, did you really call me? You are not alone. Because any man and woman of God within the church can identify and have empathy with you because we've all been hearing that same voice from the accuser. We've all been hearing that same voice from the enemy. The greatest things you've seen, that's, that's behind you. That moment of encounter, that, that wasn't even real. That was just in, that was just in your imagination. But this is what I want to tell you. Peter did some great things. Andrew, man, took the gospel all throughout those nations, Romania and Georgia, the Ukraine, uh, you know, into Cyprus. All. Jesus, he did some amazing things. 
but we are about to see a greater things move of God. We're about to see a generation that does, you're, there, there's about to be people that you've never even heard of. People that don't even deserve to be used by God, that God uses to reveal himself, that God uses to spread the gospel. You're going to say, who? Who, who, is, who is that? And you're going to look in the mirror and say, this is ridiculous. Why would God use me? Did God really say? Yes, God really did say. And this is what the enemy has done throughout human history is tried to stir up doubt and confusion within the body of Christ so that sons and daughters would forget who they are, so that they would forget what God has called them to do, and that they would make unwise choices so that they could engineer their own lives to be predictable so they can get the kind of outcomes that they want to design. And I'm telling you something, if you want to be used by God, you got to give up your strategies. You got to give up what you think is wisdom. You got to give up what you think is logical. You got to give up what you think people are going to approve of. And you have to ask yourself the question is, will I fear man or will I fear God? I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happens. In this moment of confusion and in this moment of doubt and in this moment, movement, uh, moment of, of, of just, you know, God, did you really, am I really? And here's what the enemy does. He, he comes with an opportunity, just a, a little opportunity, an opportunity of compromise. And here's what happens. We, we begin to compromise in areas of our life. And with these little compromises, we begin opening doors up to the enemy. And then the enemy can come in and undergird the lies that we are believing. So now those lies, they get stronger. And not only are there lies, but there are also demonic influences that begin to oppress you. Why? Because in this place of confusion, in this place of isolation, in this place of, of did God really say? And with this place of compromise, the enemy comes in like a flood to overwhelm us all the more. So we go from bad to worse. And now all of a sudden, they're not lies, they're facts. And all of a sudden, we're being harassed by all these, by all these facts and, and all of these forces that come all the more just to get us to, to isolate and just to get us to divide and just to get us to do the kinds of things where we can feel that we are in control of our lives. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, um, Monday looks like Tuesday, looks like Wednesday, looks like Thursday. There's no joy, there's no peace, there's no love, but there's predictability and there's, I'll do this and I'll get a paycheck and I'll do this, I'll provide for my family, I'll do this, I'll play the game, I'll do the thing, but there's no joy in it and there's no peace in it, and then that leads to more compromise. And then the enemy comes and undergirds the compromise, and it gets stronger, and it gets stronger, and it gets stronger. And I believe that the, tonight is the night to expose the lies of the enemy. We're pointing out his strategy. This is what the enemy is doing. You're not alone. You get, you're sitting by people that are in the same battle. You're sitting by people that are just as dis discouraged as you are. You're sitting by people that have been hearing the same, the same lies of the enemy. This is what you need to know. You are not alone. And this is actually very, very exciting because all of hell is coming at you. Why? Because hell knows who you are a little bit more than you know who you are. This is what I want to tell you. Wow. You are actually worth attacking. Wow, you should be so honored that out of everybody, the enemy has chosen to attack you. That the enemy has chosen to try to deceive you. Wow, wow, I must be really cool. All the hell is coming after me. Wow, the United States of America must be really cool. Why? All the hell is coming after our country. Wow, Seattle, Washington must be really cool. Why? Because hell is running the city, right? Wow. Washington State, wow. Oregon, oh my gosh, wow. Portland, wow. Wow, LA, 
state. Wow, California. Yeah, wow, we are worth attacking. And this is what I know. The Lord is trying to teach us how to eat at his banqueting table in the presence of our enemy. This is what David said. The Lord is my shepherd. This is a peculiar shepherd. Why? Because this shepherd, um, uh, uh, I, I, will, I will fear no evil. You are my shepherd, right? Your rod and your staff, you know, they protect. And yet he has prepared for me a table, me, his little lamb. He's prepared for me, his little lamb, a table in the presence of the wolves. And this is what the Lord is teaching us. This is how the Lord is training us. He's training us, his lambs, to eat and be at peace in the presence of wolves. He's teaching us to trust him. He's teaching us to rest in him. He's teaching us to hear his voice. And he's teaching us to obey his voice. And when we fail, there's mercy. And when we fail, there's grace to train us and our failure so next time we can discern the frequency of the enemy and choose to not compromise. You're being trained for war. You're being trained to stand in his victory and in his righteousness. And I don't know how much you've been beat up and I don't know how much you've compromised, but there's mercy here tonight. There's grace here tonight. And this is what I know. That at the end of the day, you will be trusted. Why? Because you walk with a limp. I just declare the courage of Christ Jesus over you right now. I just declare the grace of God that would come and to expose every lie of the enemy, to expose it and to disable it. This is what I know. You are a son, you are a daughter of the most high God. You don't have to hide from him. you can run to him with your honesty, with your pain, with your rejection, with all your failures. You can run to him and he will receive you. He will love you and he will train your hands for war. Let's stand. Hey. Okay, chill out. Close your eyes. Just put out your hands and just receiving posture. Take a deep breath. Just declare, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Yeah, there he is, there he is, there he is, there he is. Oh, Yeah, yeah, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord. Come, 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 come. Ikiria shakara koshoro koshiki ya kara kashiki ya oshara kashiki le amasi kira masoko do koshiki ya eshi le amakoshira kashiki la siki ya siki ya eshi kia saki ya kuru gombo koshiki ya saki ya eshi kia na na koshiki ya da da kishiki ya yeah 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 shiki ya saka shokuru ko. Esiki ya mashiki ya sukoda la ki ya la kosha la ki ya. Esiki ya shokoro poko shiki ya saki ya. Esikara kashi ya kusoto kashi ya kara kashi ki ya. 
Heshana makishi ki asoro ko shoro ko hikia. Hese karaka shiki asoro ko shiki ya 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 koro ko ya 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 ya. My eyes are on you, my son. My eyes are on you, my daughter. My eyes are even on the sparrow. So how much more would my concentration and focus be upon you and your life? How much more would my heart be going out to the details, to the aspects, to the hurts, and to your wounds? How much more would my heart be breaking for you in the areas that your heart has been broken in this season? I am not rejecting you. I am wooing you. I am inviting you to come to me with who you really are, to come to me with your brokenness, to come to me with your wounds, to come to me with your blood, for my blood was shed for you, for my heart was broken for your broken heart, for I was bruised and I was wounded and I was rejected and I am a king I am a priest who can empathize with you in your brokenness and thus saith the Lord your God I am working in your brokenness I am working in your woundedness I am working even in your sinfulness that even in your rebellion I am at work says the Lord your God and I will take these foolish things these these broken vessels and I will restore them for my glory and I will make them a, a showcase I will make them great trophies of my glory thus saith the Lord I am taking the broken vessels I am taking the broken pieces I am taking them into my cut hands I am taking them into my bloody hands and I am putting the pieces back together and with my kiss I will bring forth life and with my gaze I will restore your dignity and with who I am I will show up in your life and not just in your life but in all the aspects in all the branches and in all the roots and in all the soil that my character and nature and power will reverberate in and through you I am a God of restoration I am a Lord of love I am a king of justice I will not ignore your brokenness I will not uh, ignore your cry my heart is open my gaze is upon you my son my gaze is upon you my daughter I am calling for you tonight to step forward to come forward to give me your heart to give me your hands to give me your masculinity to give me your femininity to give me the fullness of your identity for I do not want for you to shame you. I do not want for you to shame your masculinity. I do not want for you to shame your sexuality. I do not want for you to shame your emotions. I do not want for you to shame you. For I am not saying shame on you. I am saying shame off of you. And I will restore you to a state better than birth. You will be born again. You will receive a new language. I will take your heart of stone. I will give to you a heart of flesh I will give to you my own spirit my spirit which is holy and it will transform you and it will transfigure you and it will so occupy you that you will function with a function that is not of you for it will not be by your might and it will not be by your power but it will be by my spirit says the Lord hallelujah 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 God This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna come into his presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. We're gonna come into his presence and into his courts with praise. We're gonna say, this is the day that the Lord hath made and I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I wanna open up this altar. If, if the Lord is tugging in your heart, if you know that tonight is a, is a shifting, Point night. If you know that tonight is a tipping point night, if you know that tonight you're going to leave your change radically different, not because of a sermon, not because of Darren, but because of the presence of the Lord, I want to open up this altar and I want for you to establish a Bethel. I want for you to establish an altar. I want for you to come before the Lord like Jacob. In, in this place, we say the Spirit of God is here and I can sense it and I can discern it. And I just want Josh just to begin to lead us into a place 
of just worship and adoration and into this place of great rejoicing for he is worthy. He is worthy of our surrender. He is worthy of our consecration. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy. He is worthy of everything, everything that we are.